Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that's loud. I didn't even have to use my teacher voice. Oh, okay. So maybe if I hold it out here, it's better or closer? Closer. Okay. I'm very excited to introduce today's speakers who have driven to us from rainy Seattle and will present spirit whales and sloth tales. But first, we have a, a few announcements. As many of you read the email about the uh, loss of our geologic cheerleader, Leslie Aiken, who passed in October. I'd like to ask for a minute of silence so that we can remember her and think of her in the a very... It's been a community gathering, a social event, and the QGS advisors are struggling between whether or not we're going to host Zoom only or in person only. We do have a member, we do not have a membership, um, that's why we ask for the donations and we thank everybody who has um, supported us today and in the past. We need to have some money to be able to get the videos up on our website, so thank you, and to maintain the website. <clears throat> so, um, our next presentation will be December 9th. David Brownell will discuss drainage evolution of the Dungeness River. This will be a Zoom-only presentation. And then on January 13th, we welcome back Ralph Hagerud to lecture on glacial landscapes of the Puget Sound. Other speakers <coughs> in, the clue, in the queue include Brian Sherrod and Pat Pringle. Remember to che check out the Quimper Geology webpage for um, presentation specifics. Well, they sound so much more interesting than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not today. <clears throat> okay, so check out our webpage as um, more information becomes available, we post it online. Um, now the introduction. <clears throat> it is an honor to introduce two speakers today. Both the speakers are QGS friends and previous presenters. Liz Nesbitt is known as the Curator Emerita of Invertebrate Paleontology at the Mus Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. She was born in Zimbabwe and grew up on a ranch in the country where she learned about the amazing natural history around her. She received a degree in marine biology from the University of Cape Town and she knew that she wanted to be a paleontologist because she loved evolution. This is how Liz found geology. Her fossils professor told her that she needed to have the concept of geology to be able to um, be a paleontologist. Liz and her husband, Mike, moved to California so Liz could receive a PhD in geology at the University of California, Berkeley. After several years and various jobs later, they moved to Seattle so Liz could work at the University of Washington. Recently, I, I learned that Liz met Kitty Reed in 1997, which is also the year that I met Kitty Reed. <clears throat> Our past not crossed yet. <clears throat> We, as a community, continue to benefit from Liz working as a paleontologist. David Williams is an award-winning author, naturalist, and tour guide. David moved to Washington when he was five years old. Although when you read his books, you would think his understanding comes from being born from all the rock and life forms we have in Washington. David attended Colorado College, where he set out to study about human-powered transportation and perhaps engineer a new bike. Instead, on a three-day bike trip, some random guy suggested to David that he needed to take a geology class in his um, second year of college. He did, and he immediately knew he wanted to major in field trips. David, <laughs> David and his lovely wife, uh, Marjorie, live in North Seattle, where he now writes. I find David's books um, are like a good field trip, an interdisciplinary, deep connection to this place we call home. His subjects tend to be focused in and around the beautiful Puget Sound and Washington, and he digs into the details. Thank you for the great footnotes. David also authors the weekly newsletter titled Street Smart Naturalist, in which he provides us with many interconnected pieces of science to dwell on. As his ability to get into the details about his subjects is amazing. Just ask him something obscure like, Tell me about kelp reproduction. These two unique people <laughs> have co-authored the 
book titled Spirit Whales and Sloth Tales. Let us all welcome Liz Nesbitt and David Williams. Wow, uh, can you all hear us, hear me? So far, good. So Carol, thank you, Michael, thank you, and the rest of the Quimper gang. I think this is the third time I've spoken up here, and it is always a pleasure to speak to people who take that, their concern with the natural world and are out there looking, exploring, and trying to understand the stories. As Carol said, that's what I've been trying to do as a writer for the last 25 years or so, and it's been very much an honor for the last several years to be working with Liz on this book, uh, Spirit Whales and Sloth Tales. What we'd like to do tonight is start out with just a very short reading from the introduction to the book, and then Liz and I want to chat a little bit about the book, and then we will focus on three of the profiles um, in the book, and you'll understand what that means in a second. Um, so again, it's just an honor and pleasure to be here and to share these stories. So let me just launch in, since I'm that kind of guy. In 2014, a construction worker near downtown Seattle found a tusk while excavating for a new building. Paleontologists from the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture soon arrived. They worked past mid midnight to unearth the delicate fossil, wrap it in protective plaster, and arrange pr transport to the museum for what turned out to be the remains of a mammoth that lived around 15,000 years ago. Also arriving were the media and onlookers, some of whom chanted, dig it up, dig it up. For those who watched and participated in the discovery at South Lake Union, it was a thrilling time as the fossil remains connected viewers to a distant world recently scraped raw by a 3,000 foot thick sheet of ice. Seeing the tusks, they could imagine a chilly post-glacial landscape of giant mammals, formidable predators, and plants recolonizing the barren landscape. Like all fossils, the tusk was a window into a past completely different from the urban one now found at this location. The onlookers who experienced those heady few hours are certainly not alone in succumbing to the allure of ancient time. Over the decades, uncounted numbers of people have had similar experiences, finding a fossil in Washington state and being tantalized by it and the connection it, it provides to the region's geological history. No matter where you wander in Washington, you are never very far from the past and the fossil evidence of those who came before. You can find trilobites near the Idaho border, primitive horses on the Columbia Plateau, exquisite flowers in Republic, giant bird tracks near Bellingham, and curious bear-like beasts on the Olympic Peninsula. With abundant and well-exposed rock layers, Washington has fossils dating from Ice Age mammals only 12,000 years old, back to marine invertebrates more than 500 million years old. In order to help readers more fully appreciate what fossils have to tell us, we start spirit whales and sloth tales with a basic introduction to geology, and specifically the geology of Washington State, along with an understanding of how plants and animals fossilize and how geologists determine the age of fossils. Just a quick interruption. One of our goals was to book, be a book about paleontology, but also provide that background for those people who didn't have the deep, incredible knowledge that Liz has, and then have her share it in such a way that you all benefit from being in a little class with her. We follow with 24 profiles that are the heart and most important part of the book. We see each of these profiles as a short story where we can explore a topic that may or may not re relate to the preceding or following profile, but that fits into the broader story of life over time in Washington. Like a paleontologist excavating fossils, the profiles are organized with the youngest first, allowing the reader to dig deeper and deeper, unearthing stories strata by strata. Each fo profile focuses on a specific plant, animal, or environment often weaving in human history and geology, and always with the goal of fleshing out details necessary for a deeper understanding that will help make the fossils come to life. Ultimately, our goal is for you to come away with a more thorough appreciation of the spectacular paleontology and geology of Washington State. So we want to have a conversation, but before we do that, I really want to make uh, a central part of what I feel with this book. It was very much a privilege for me to work with Liz, and we'll talk about how that came to be, but I really see this book as Liz's brainchild, um, as her passion being brought to, to the, the pages. 
and so for me it's been uh, an honor and pleasure of course to work with you and what's more amazing I think is that we've worked together for four years we've known each other for many years we've worked together at the Burke for a long time sort of off and on but after four years of working together pretty intimately on this book with lots and lots and lots of discussions and editing we're still friends and to me that speaks very highly of Liz as a scientist as someone who not only recognizes the importance of science but the importance of communicating in a way that is approachable to all people. So again, thank you, Liz. Oh, thank you. And so my first question is, no, not by me. What was your inspiration, Liz? What, what brought, what, this is, this is a lifetime. So this is a lifetime. So I've been thinking about this book for a very long time. Um, and teaching undergraduate students, working in the museum, meeting all sorts of people who are interested in fossils, interested in geology, doing field trips all around the state. Lots of people asked me if there was more information out there. Well, there isn't. So I knew I had to write a book. And the first person I talked to about this is Kitty Reed. And that was a, gee, a long time ago, because she was still working down in um, for Washington Geology then. And we had these lovely ideas, and I think we talked from here to Nevada all about this. And then our lives went in different directions. Um, and when I retired, it was time to write this book. So it did. So the question then is, why did David say yes when I asked him if he would collaborate with me? <laughs> David, why did you say yes? And you've got to be nice about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, as anyone knows, writing for an academic press, the money is amazing. <laughs> so, I, first was obviously finances. I was just going to cash in on the book. Um, but really, more importantly, is it gets back to what Carol said at the beginning and what I alluded to a little bit, is my interest in this landscape. I've lived in Seattle for most of my life and have always been interested in this place around me. And I wanted to figure out another way to tell more stories. And so when Liz approached me about this idea of focusing on the fossils, I thought it was a perfect way to continue my goal of trying to help people connect to landscape, to develop relationships. Um, as a writer, my goal, one of my central goals is, I hope in reading my work, you'll want to get outside, but then you'll also want to just see things differently. You'll want to slow down and pay more attention and ask more questions. And so I saw this as an opportunity to sort of pull that together in a different way than I had done before. Many of my books have been focused more on urban stories. I did a book about building stone, very urban, and this is really, you know, it's sort of the opposite. This is, all, all of this is out in the field. And so that was really the, the genesis. And also having worked with you for a long time, I knew we would get along on that. Um, and the point of all of this is that when I wrote the book without David, um, it didn't sound very exciting. I'm an academic and I write scientific books. George will know exactly what I mean by this. And I needed somebody to bring the stories to life. Because it's not just about fossils, it's about the people who collect fossils, it's about how we find out what we know. And I needed somebody who knew how to do that, and I assumed he did. He did. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of the, the why we, we got along. And it was very uh, different for me working, because usually when I do books, I do all the research myself. I dive deep and come up with all this. But Liz had all the knowledge. And so I would, she would write, and we'd go back and forth on editing. And one of the things that, and you didn't say this, and we, we talked about this previously, this is not a textbook. This is not an academic book. This is, nor is it a guidebook. It's not a field guide. It's really a series of stories, as we said, I said, about this place, about the landscape, about individual species, about anything from mammoths, mammoths and mastodons to trilobites. I mean, it's, it really covers the array of stories. And, and you might, so the, the idea for each of these came from your experience of just trying to feel what is most interesting. What, how did you choose your species? Uh, it's actually very hard to choose because you can imagine there's a lot to say. People don't think Washington has a lot of fossils, but we do. We just have a lot of volcanic rocks as well. Um, and so I actually chose the stories of things that people I had talked to in the museum found interesting. A couple of them are because I found them interesting. Um, but a lot of them were about things that grab people's attention. 
and that's how I chose them. And some of them got left on the chopping board, so we'll have a volume two sometime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I may not live that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was a, yeah, a lot of... So, you've been in paleontology for a bit. Uh, what's changed? How is it different than it was when you started? The biggest change is technology. Technology has brought a whole new world into paleontology. All the different imaging techniques of, of CT scans and MRIs and those types of, of invasive visual things, you can see fossils inside rocks. And so often paleontologists, vertebrate paleontologists, will take their um, fossil and somehow talk the hospital into doing a, a CAT scan on it and then you can see what's inside. Um, and they just did this with the big salmon that I'm going to talk about down in Oregon. The other thing is uh, the opportunity to have much better radiometric dating of various types of dating. And one of the problems with paleontology always is we don't really know where these things fit together because we don't have good radiometric dating. And that, the technology for that has improved enormously. So many of the controversies that are of old were largely about what people thought their fossil was. And now that's a lot better. And I have to warn you that all paleontologists think their fossils are older. <laughs> it was always the assumption we have things that are older than they probably are. Uh, what else is changed? Well, the other thing that you, you changed is just the dynamic, is the interdisciplinary nature. Oh, yeah. Talk yeah, a lot about that's that. one thing. I mean, um, when I started way back, you were strongly encouraged to work on your own to show people what your scholarship was and how you did this. And now, life's got more complicated and we realize how many things we need. And we, biologists and geologists, that's what paleontologists are, but we need chemistry, we need physics, we need to understand um, statistics, we need big picture things. You have to work with other people. And that's been a wonderful part of new paleontology, is working in groups of people interdisciplinary groups to come up with a single story. Uh, that's one of the best things that's happened lately. And you, you described it as, I mean, as we said earlier, it's bringing, they're helping to bring the fossils to life. It's now. bringing the fossils to life. We used to, and David always mentions this, we used to describe fossils and give it a name. And now a lot of that has been done. I mean, there's still tons to do, and it's absolutely essential. But now we're looking at groups of fossils and saying, how did they live? How did they interact? What was the environment like at one specific time? How did it change? How do we know that it's changed? So those are much bigger questions than um, naming a fossil. If you don't name a fossil, you have nothing to talk about. So it's very important that you name fossils. And as you'll see, we'll talk about the dinosaur that was found. It doesn't have a name, so there's really nothing to talk about. <laughs> but we will talk about it because it's actually interesting, not the dinosaur, but, it, but what, it, the story it. behind the dinosaur. So I have a question for David. Uh -oh. um, because and it really goes back to what he said. What, how did you choose what to put in the book? There is an enormous time and spatial gap between the earliest fossils in northeastern um, Washington, Cambrian and age, and the next thing we do, which is Cretaceous, in the islands. How come? What happened there? <laughs> yes, you're, you're a geologist, you know. So, I mean, I, as someone who's long thought about geology, I mean, the one thing that I all, a point I always try to make to people who are non-geologists, I think probably many people in this audience recognize this idea. So wherever you look, there's more, more of the picture is missing than is present. No matter where you are on Earth, even go to a place, Grand Canyon, a mile of rocks, there's still more history that is not there than is there. So no matter where you are, you have all that, there's all those challenges. And the other aspect of it is that Washington is very much this puzzle piece. If you were here 500 million years ago, roughly, Basically, Washington was that northeast corner of the state up around sort of Medellin Falls. That was Washington. And over time, rock has been added through a variety of different means, primarily through some major plate tectonic action of moving slivers of rock onto Washington. So we just, there's just things missing because we were in the wrong place or the rock was here. It got, we have this other issue that Liz mentioned. 
The problem of geology, of course, is we have a lot of basalt. We have a lot of it, uh, you know, we have the mountains. Stuff could be there, but it's buried. So we just are missing many of the, of the pictures that are out there, which makes it, you know, some of the stories that we tell, we gain from areas that are nearby that have some rock exposed that we don't. And so we, we do draw in some, some information from other places. We don't give them credit, of course, because it's, you know, why should we? Because Washington's so amazing. Uh, but we do sort of draw in information. But it really is that idea that there's always more of the story missing in geology than present. Just, it's a complicated world. Think about the world, you know, here. How, you go out in the water, you're on land, there's such variation. How is that going to be show up in the fossil record or in the rock record 100 million years from now? And also some of the stories were not, there's a lot of work to be done. I met a young person who's going to be a paleontologist today. I'm thrilled because there's so much work to be done. <laughs> so there were some stories that didn't get written, didn't get finished because we realized this, we don't know enough yet. We need more paleontologists out there working on these things. Um, and so it was kind of odd to have a book that specializes uh, in the things we know a lot about. And a lot of that is Western Washington because, well, guess what? It's the most interesting place. <laughs> and there's just a lot more. Are there more fossils? Well, Western Washington has more fossils. It's the youngest. So the younger rocks have more fossils than the older rocks. Um, and so we just have a lot of fossils. And that's where I've worked all my life. And so I know most of, most of the stuff that goes on around here. The other thing is we do have a lot of very talented amateur paleontologists, avocational occasional paleontologists. Some of them publish papers, some of them go out and collect fossils, um, and more people live on the west side than on the east side. So more fossils are found by these people. Some of them are amazing. Some of these people are amazing what they bring in. And that was really a central point for us in the book, and Liz mentioned it early on, this idea of this book is not just about the rocks, it's not just about the paleontology, but it's also a lot about the people who were doing the research, who were out collecting, and we'll talk a couple of, about a couple of the stories today about how people came across these different things. But it's, the, over time, that's what's been amazing, is that people have collected materials from a huge range of places who were not professionals, who were, and there's only a handful of quote unquote professional paleontologists, few academic paleontologists. Most it's an avocation. I mean, it's one of those sciences that really has benefited over the decades. And, and we were trying to find those stories and use their names because we felt that very an important part of it. Yeah. And um, the other thing to add here is because I've been part of the Berg, many of the fossils that I talked about are in the Berg Museum, either in the collections or on display. So. Um, when you, those of you who buy the book and look at the book, you'll see many of those fossils that actually are on display or will be on display because we rotate our exhibits around. The Burke Museum is the only official paleontology museum in the state. There's plenty of other unofficial cute museums. Um, but we are the Washington State official natural history museum. Um, and there's a lot of stuff there. So there were a lot, many things that dictated what went into this book. Um, and what fell off the table as we went along. And so a lot of the talks, but a lot of it are in the collections. Maybe you could tell us about um, Mike, the photographer, and what his, I mean, that was a really a key part of the book. Yes. So Mike, who did all the photographs of the fossils. Mike Rich. Mike Rich, almost all the fossils in the book, um, was a volunteer. And he is a retired engineer from Boeing. Um, and he is a photographer, he was very interested, he thought he would just do photography when he retired and then decided he needed something more. So he came and volunteered and when you volunteer at the Berg they ask you what you want to do and then they ask us if we want anybody who has a special key and I had just got a grant and bought this fabulous new camera that is automatic in some areas, you can move up and down, you can take big things and little things and he was so good. He had never seen fossils before, he had never looked at fossils before, and he just had an eye. And some of those fossils, some of the pictures in the book, we did many, many times, and he was so patient. And he would go home and he said, I'd go home and think about it, and think about those fossils and what I should do. So he was a very talented person. And didn't you say that it shoots multiple images 
and then combines them into one so everything's really in focus. So it's an automatic um, camera that will automatically drop down and take pictures of very tiny little things, especially spherical things, and keep each of those little slices in focus, and then the software will produce it all. So you can see why I couldn't possibly have done this. Um, and you come up with this perfect image. And that, I mean, and, and that alone is enough to buy the book. I mean, just because the images are, <laughs> they are, they're amazing images. And, you know, fossils, we all know fossils not, are, are not always the most handsome no. things. Some of the shells, I mean, even though I know you're, you're an invertebrate person, I mean, invertebrate paleontologist, okay. you're a vertebrate <laughs> person. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, oops. Very close. Very yeah, close. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of that, I, uh, this is a, if you could be dropped back in time, uh -huh. When would you go? And uh, why would you this, go? And what would you do? That's an easy one. If I could be dropped back in time, I would be in what we call the Eocene. And the Eocene is about 50 million to about 38 million or so years ago. And Western Washington, the edge of Western Washington is where the I-5 is now. And it was warm, and it was tropical, and it was wet, and it was gorgeous. There was no Cascades, there was no Olympics. It was just a big... How can I say? It was a place where there were lots of weird and strange animals too. And um, there was no snow, there was no ice, there was no ice on the planet. A beautiful time to be alive. And what would you do? I mean, would you just like, would you like walk around? I would just lie in the sun. I'm in Seattle by the sea. Seattle by the sea? Can you think how lovely that oh would be? My. Well, it is by the it's the, by, by the a tropical. It's, it's cold, so I can ask you the same question. So, were there there were some big think? there were some big things. There was back a big, there. and I'm going to talk about. Oh, you are. Oh, yeah. I thought I was going to talk. About oh, I'm right. oh, okay. Well. Um, if I could be dropped back in time, I would want to be hanging out with a giant sloth in eastern Washington when the Missoula floods, when a Missoula flood went by, because. I thought about, you know, there's other animals, but you know, man, sloths are big, they're soft, probably just be hanging out, real chilling out. And I would love that, just to watch this phenomenal flow of water going by. Uh, that would be my time period. If I, any, if I could see any geologic event on Earth. Yeah, that would be it. That would be it. That, I think, is the most amazing geologic event ever. Um, and it took a few slots with it, you know. <laughs> well, we would be on a hill. Oh, I see. <laughs> we, we would be, me and my sloth would be up on the hill, hanging out. I, I, I'd grab him or her or they by the hand and we'd head up there and it'd be all great. Yeah. What an imagination this man has. <laughs> Anything else you want to ask me about? Or you um, want to sure about. I'd like to talk about the book. I mean, I'd okay. Like to talk, okay. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, do that. Yeah, so, like to. so the next thing we're going to do is, is give a little um, brief overview of one of the chapters in the book. and um, Three of them. You're going to do one and I'm going to do two, I think. Um, okay, three. I love it. Yeah, because yeah. you're still here. Because we could be here all night, so we have to stop ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's do that. Okay. And I think we need to make sure that... Okay, now how, how do we do the... See if we can do this. So that's on. It looks like on. And I think, let's see if this might. There it is. So it's just here's your forward and backwards. And here's your mic. You need two hands. You're fine. It's, uh, you should be about six, five, six, yeah. one. I don't know. I'll, I can talk less. Okay. I know it's weird. Oh, it's there's the mute button. Oh, there's a mute button. And you got to hold the mute okay, button. Okay, Got to hold it. No. All right. How's that? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> I see why Carol. We had to jump back. Let's see if I can do this. So this is like doing three things at once. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was this area in. Um, I'm gonna move this somehow so I don't fall down the stairs. Um, this is the Ringgold Formation. So. I, geared this talk a little bit towards geology rather than towards the um, biology part of, of what we're talking about. This is the Ringgold Formation just north of Pasco. It's along the Columbia River here and it's, um, I, don't, I can't remember how many stratigraphic feet, but I have it written down, of river gravels, sands, sediments, uh, 90 meters of, of things um, that ranges from 
the Miocene all the way to the Pliocene. It overlies the Cambrian basalts, but there is a big unconformity in there, and we're not really sure what the bottom is. On top is more is more non-marine stuff. So this stratigraphic column here was from Steve Rydell, and it was made for a different project altogether. It was made for a hydrology project. But at least you can see at the bottom are big gravels as you go up, the, the sediments get finer and finer. We do have some radiometric dates there because there's some basalt in between. There are lots of fossils there. There are lots of fossils in these, these riverbeds. This is one of the most exciting ones. And this fossil breeds here, Suga Kelly's, is, is um, the first deer, the oldest deer in North America. Bretz here named J. Harlan Bretz, who was the person who first figured out those Missoula floods. And um, the species name means false moose. Eric Justison found that, and you can see in the one picture, you can see what he actually found of the antlers. A long time ago, it was stuck together in the plaster of Paris. We wouldn't do that anymore, but nobody wants to touch these now. And we have jaws, and we have other things. It's one of the many fossils we've got. So a little story about Eric, because it's interesting. He was a high school kid. It's like 1970, 69, 70, um, down in Pasco, and he said life was very boring. So he went wandering around, and he found fossils. He found fossils in these rocks here. And he suddenly became fascinated. So he went out and collected fossils. Nobody wanted to stop him. Nobody told him not to do so. And somehow or other, I'm not quite sure what the connection was, he contacted people at Los Angeles County Museum. Um, and there, a guy called Wayne Fry was really very interested in what he was doing and came up and encouraged Eric to do this. Eric has published most of the papers on these faunas. He went on eventually to get a PhD in paleontology and became a professor down in, in Oregon. Um, and some of these fossils, by the way, are on display at the Reach Museum if you've ever been down to, down to the Tri-Cities area. From what Eric did, people could put together the fact that a few five to three million years ago, this is what the environment looked like. We're in the Pliocene, so it's not as warm as what I want in the Eocene. And the Pliocene is one of those things where if you work in the Miocene, the Pliocene is much cooler. If you work in the Ice Ages, they call the Pliocene the warm Pliocene, which is just weird. Um, but it was a riparian environment. How do we know this? How do we get to know all these things about reconstructing the environment? One of the main things we use is pollen. Fossil pollen is amazing. Pollen survives, and if you get it out of the, the rocks and you look at it sequence by sequence, you can see changes in the environment. Which trees were there, which grasses were there, which um, flowers were there, and you can see how change happens. So that was one of the reasons. The other way they could do it is by all the different fossils. There are so many fossils in this ring um, and first of all, there are two different rhinos. One of them is this little short, so legged rhino. Sorry, short legged rhino. I mean, he's a cute little guy. Um, and a megalonyx, older than the David's favorite sloth, but an old megalonyx. A lot of very small mammals, which tells you a lot about the environment. And one of the more exciting things is this spike toothed salmon. Now, some of you might have seen Red Charles' picture of the saber toothed salmon. He's not a saber-toothed salmon. He had these little teeth that stuck out sideways, not as Ray um, painted him. He's a spike-toothed salmon. And we have some there in the Pasco Basin. There's a lot down in Oregon and Northern California. They were huge. They got to be two and a half meters. They could weigh 200 to 300 pounds. Imagine catching that in your little boat in the lake. Um, and of course, they had to go up and down to the sea. They salmon. And the ones we get were spawning salmon. So that tells you a story about the Pasco Basin was connected to the sea. However, it's a little more complicated than that. Around six to seven million years ago, just the beginning of the Miocene, uh, the end of the Miocene, beginning of the Pliocene, there are these salmon. After that, the salmon disappear. And there are no more 
um, salmon and this evidence that now the Columbia River was not going through the Pasco Basin, this area where all these little short faced rhinos were had been separated from the sea. And the fish there were now lake fish, a number of different lake fish. Um, and I actually have a list of them, but I'm not sure you really care about which ones there were. Um, there was sunfish, catfish, suckers, minnows, and a bunch of others. At 3 million years, or 2.8 million years, suddenly there's a complete change in the fish fauna. And we get the fish that were already there, but lots of fish that actually came from Idaho. There were fish that were much cooler water, higher um, elevation in Idaho, and also fish that were more related to much further east. So the rivers had changed yet again. Um, and the story, it's hard to remember what I'm doing here. So this is the picture. At that time, 2.8 million years ago, the Snake River connected itself to the Columbia River. And you can tell that from the fish fossils. And it's really hard to tell in any other way. So that's my story. Now David has a story. A fun story. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Uh, so arguably the most unusual fossil in Washington State, I'm probably familiar with, is the Blue Lake Rhino. I mean, it's, it's an astounding fossil. If you're not familiar with it, it's found uh, near the, uh, tri near, 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 in eastern Washington. Um, woo, we're not even going to have that, so we're not going to worry about it. In eastern Washington, near Blue Lake. Story goes is that in July of 1935, two couples from Washington were exploring the basalt in that area, uh, and they were looking for petrified wood. But when they were hiking around, they ended up coming across this sort of curious looking cave. They're about two or 300 feet above um, the, the lake in what was called Jasper Canyon. And they find this cave is about 90 inches long and it had a couple of curious little cavities in it. And it also had a couple of bones in it. So they collect the bones. They take them back to the, the University of Washington, which does not have a paleontologist at the time. So the bones get transferred to a gentleman named George Beck on the east side of the mountains. Beck looks at it, he goes out, and he thinks it's some sort of some sort of rhinoceros, but he's not sure. It's just it's a sort of curious looking animal. The bones then get transferred to the California Institute of Technology, where another paleontologist looks at it. And he says, oh, it's, it's definitely a rhino. It's this one, it's a type of rhino that doesn't have any, doesn't have any horns. Then it jumps forward. Another group of paleontologists look at this and say, oh, you're totally wrong. It's a rhino, but this, this rhino actually has two horns. So they go back and forth. We now know, though, that it was a, di was a rhino. Right? Oh, there. Sorry. This rhino, this is the rhino, uh, has a curved horn, and this is the most recent sort of study of it. And what's great, I think, partially about the story is that just with a minimal, with a variety of information from the cave, this basalt cave, and from the bones, they're able to basically create the story of what this dino, what this rhinoceros was like. So we have a rhinoceros living about 15.8 million years ago. At this time, um, it eventually, like all animals, it eventually dies. And so it ends up upside down and bloated, floating in a lake. And this being an area with lots of basalt and lava, lava comes in, buries our little rhinoceros, and if you're sure you all have heard the story that if you have igneous rocks, you don't have fossils. I said it earlier in the talk. Generally, if you have igneous rock, you don't have fossils. But in this case, when that basalt hits the water, it cools and forms a mold around the dinosaur, the, excuse me, the dinosaur, keeps saying, the dead rhino that's bloated, floating there, and eventually people go in, and you can't, unfortunately you can't see where those two arrows are, there's the entrances to the cave, and unfortunately that is a problem in this area, that there's painted on the rocks how to get to this exact spot. Fortunately, it's long enough ago that all the fossils that were there were collected by scientists and not by random. People. But it's just sort of an astounding story that this rhinoceros lived, dies, ends up in a lake, floating, 
magma comes, lava comes in and cools it. And it is arguably not just the most unusual fossil in Washington State, probably one of the most unusual fossils in the world. And it's an astounding, astounding thing. And you may remember the Burke used to have a mold of it um, in, the, in the museum, which was great for teaching kids programs because we'd stuff kids into the, into the rhinoceros. And, <laughs> And, and I would say, oh yeah, we once got 30 kids in here. If you've ever been, it holds about six kids, and it was fun to see all the kids pushing um, in there, which is why I'm no longer in education at the Berkeley Museum. <laughs> so let's take a jump in. And I said we weren't really going to talk about dinos, but I am going to talk about our one dinosaur, because our one dinosaur is actually sort of an interesting story. So if you're familiar with the San Juan Islands, you probably know that the San Juan Islands are like the rest of the state. They are this puzzle assembled by plate tectonics, by uh, the, that conveyor belt of moving a variety of rocks. So the north end of the island, um, Susha, upper part of the island, is sedimentary rock about 50 million years old. The lower part of it is uh, a marine sediment about 80 million years, and there's even fossil bay there. And so, again, the so story goes, in 2012, two geologists, uh, David Starr and Jim Gettard, probably some of you are familiar with them, were out there looking for ammonites. They were interested in marine animals in that those layers out there. And they're not associated with the Burke, or they're not, they don't work for the Burke, but they're very much associated and have made great contributions. But they see this curious bone right here next to the gentleman. And many of you who are you know, out there in the field might recognize that and see that, well, that's sort of curious looking. Most people wouldn't. Uh, fortunately, Getter and Starr did. They realized that there was something odd about it. They thought it was some sort of vertebrate, some part of a vertebrate animal. So they contact the Burke, and the Burke sends a crew out. They go out. You can only access it at low tide. They go out at low tide. They have just a handful of hours, and just as time's running out, they eventually get the fossil out. Uh, unfortunately, they had to break it. Um, this is a shot of it, that red line is basically where the break is, and they realize that it is a part of a femur of a dinosaur. They can tell immediately by the texture that it is a dinosaur versus a marine reptile. So they bring it back, and, and it then ends up in the Burke. Nothing happens. It's the first dinosaur ever found in Washington State, and it just sits there. Finally, though, the Burke administration finds out about it and is very, very excited. So they provide money to uh, a gentleman, Brandon Peacock, who was in the previous photo holding the big bone. He goes around comparing his bone to what he can find in other museums, and he determines that this bone comes from some sort of Tyrannosaurid, not T-Rex, because T-Rex is much younger, 66 million years old, and these rocks, as I said, are 80 million years old. So he figures it out, and that's all we know about this animal, is that it was a large meat eater, most likely related to T-Rex. Uh, yeah, that's exciting, and it's the first one. And so on one level, it's, a, it's sort of a nice story, another level, it's sort of a boring story, but if you dive deeper, and this is what Liz and I were really interested in, in exploring the subject, it is an amazing story. Because this dinosaur, as you all are well aware, lived on land. So it's, by definition, they are land-based animals. If it's, they live in the water, they're marine reptiles, not dinosaurs. If they fly, they're flying like pterosaurs. They're not dinosaurs. So this animal lived on land, and yet it's found in marine sediments. So what happened? The guess is, is that the animal was living perhaps near a river, dies, and that bone or part of its body is carried out to sea gets covered up in the sediment, washed into the sediment, and then somehow someone finds that bone in that marine sediment. So that in and of itself is astounding. It's not something that happens all the time. The other part of the story that's incredible is that those rocks, those marine sediments, and that animal, that dinosaur, they didn't live anywhere near Washington State, what is now Washington State. That rock is part of that conveyor belt that was brought to brought here at some point. So that animal lived someplace else, somewhere to the south, maybe someplace to the west, and then to the conveyor belt brought it to land. So that is an amazing part of the story. Those two, for us, were just incredible. But what makes it even also fascinating is that we know how old that fossil is, the, the, the dinosaur, not because 
of the dinosaur. Again, there's really no scientific information from that dinosaur. But the ammonites, those classically curled critters that we all are from familiar with, the big cinnamon rolls that range from size from we up to about four or five feet across, they provided the age because the, these animals which lived from about 400 to 66 million years ago, thousands of them, over 10,000 species of ammonite have been identified. And so they are basically sort of time markers in the rock when you find them. Almost always round, we also have a couple of the straight ones out there. So we learned the age, we figured out that they were 80 million year old rock. The additional part is that we then found out what was the environment like, those marine sediments. By looking at the fossils, we then gained that additional information. And then the third part of the story is by where we locate those fossils, we can then determine where that conveyor belt transported the rocks. And so for us, this was just, this illustrated what we were trying to do in the book. We were trying, as I said before, we were trying to tell stories. We were trying to talk about the geology, to write about the geology, to write about the paleontology, to write about the people, to write about the excitement of discovery and the challenges of discovery and the fact that you need new technology to be able to look into these rocks and understand them. And so for us, this was really a quintessential story. It's not about the dinosaur. It's about everything that's around it. And that's, I think, what we tried to do. And certainly Liz was a guide for me on that, of seeing that bigger picture of bringing all those stories together. So we want to end our discussion right now just doing this. And if you have questions, we'd be happy to answer questions that you have. Are there any? And we can repeat the questions if you want, or have. Oh. I need the microphone to take. Oh, <laughs> and we'll come back to here. And I would repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> questions? Anybody have a question? I heard that the blue lake rhino. I was taught back in the day that it was a juvenile, but was it? An adult, it was just a small species? It was an adult. I'm oh, sorry, so the question is, was the blue leg rhino a juvenile? Um, it is an adult. It has its full capacity of teeth. That's how it was identified from the teeth. It was just a small rhino. I mean, it was Miocene, so there were big rhinos and small rhinos. And teeth are often the best preserved, right? Yeah, I teeth don't... preserve very, very well. And this rhino, this... Um, the new genus that given it used to be Diceratherium and now it's Monoceros, is also found in um, up right all the way across Nevada, Idaho, various places. So these di these rhinos got around. They got around. There were lots of rhinos. There were lots of rhinos there, of different sizes. Hi, I was just curious about the um, uh, bison that was found out in Squim and what time frame that was. I think it was maybe. 12,000 years or something they're saying? Yeah, so the end, uh, she bison asked about the age of the bison that was found in Scrum. I don't actually know about the actual bison that was found in Scrum, but we have a lot of fossils here. Um, there were lots of bison that lived here, and as the ice moved further south, all the animals moved further south. As they moved, as the ice retreated, about 14, 13, 14,000 years ago, all the animals moved back. And some of them died and got entrained in the in the glaciers as they um, as they went back. And one of the bison was found on Orcus, right? Bison, and quite a few bison have been found on Orcus. How did they get there? Well, so that's a very interesting question. Thank you. <laughs> no. So one thing I was going to say is the bison that were here before had, were much bigger and had longer horns, so maybe that was it. But um, there's, there's also sloth, ground sloth there, there's deer there. Some of you know about um, a moose that lives on one of the islands here now. Um, they swim. All mammals swim. All mammals can swim. And even today, the small sloth, not the giant sloth we're talking about, small sloth will, will swim. They'll swim across rivers, they'll swim across lakes. Very so they slowly. Just, they're very slowly. Uh, but maybe they just jump in and go down the river. Um, so it was looking for a place to stay. Also during the Ice Age, and it, it, I'm not going to go into the complicated geology here, but sea levels were lower, so it was probably closer from the land to the islands. We also have 
um, the lamb was stuck down and, and jumped up, and we don't quite know what the distance was at different times. Probably wasn't that far. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, since I'm a victim of spending too much of my life in Southern California, I've uh, also been to the La Brea Tar Pits uh -huh. just too many times. So my question is, you know, the environment at the time those fossils were started, does that overlap with the, the fossil environment we're talking about here in the Pacific Northwest? You said uh, it was a much warmer, uh, moister uh, environment here, but um, how, how, with all the plate tectonics, did these areas overlie, or is there no connection in the, you know, with these uh, two areas? There's no connection, but it's because of time. So between La Brea and... Yeah, the La Brea tar pits were the, about 12, 14,000 years ago. What I was talking about was 50 million years ago. So, so just a very time. different environment between yeah. Southern California and where mm -hmm. we are. They're only 15,000 years old. Huh? <laughs> and there was no... They didn't have all the ice and snow down there, so yeah, it was different. So I was curious about the snaggletooth salmon that you showed. Uh, is there any idea as to whether or not it was fresh water or salt water, or whether it was, I guess the term is anatomist or something, where it migrated? Yeah, no, it's basically a marine fresh salmon, just a regular old marine salmon um, that came up to spawn, came up the rivers. So it's up in the Klamaths and the Southern Oregons, came up all the rivers and spawned. So a two meter long salmon uh, like to get yes. up to those? Yes. Okay. Up and what did the, the teeth stuck out? Or? The teeth stuck out, and they were just spawning teeth. And they sort of stick out. I'm not sure, sort of like a, a warthog, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, a much prettier thing than a warthog. Yeah. And so they would develop when they spawn. Mm -hmm. Now that'd be good. probably use that for some people. <laughs> <laughs> When you were talking about susha and the marine sediment, were you talking about the sediment that looks like sandstone, or was it very different? I, I know the been... I know the sandstone on the north side. I don't know what the I don't know what that. It, was. It's much finer grain than sandstone. It, it's really a siltstone, silt mudstone. And it, it's deep water. It's pretty deep water there. Uh, the the people who know ammonites will be able to tell you more or less. Um, what it was like. But it's supposed to like the north end of the island with the, with the sediment, the sandstone that has that weathering, that, that um, honeycomb weathering, and on oh, the south so, side doesn't okay. have that, right? So, so half of Susha is Eocene in age, and it's exactly like the rocks you get around Bellingham. The other half of Susha is this Cretaceous in age, and they were slammed together at some stage and then eroded by the glaciers. So they really have nothing to do with each other geologically, they just happen to be next door neighbors right now. Oh, George. Yeah, I, I was, uh, yeah, hi. That's really interesting that you brought up about Susie. I was uh, just out there a couple of months ago, and uh, you know that the ammonites that I see, uh, I'm from Montana, and I was a geologist at University of Montana, and I would almost think I was in the western interior seaway because uh, it looks like the Bear Paw Shale. Yes. And, uh, you hit upon a really important idea is that these are terrains and that they came from somewhere. They came from somewhere else as far but, as we know. But I think by, by Cretaceous they had probably docked. Uh, no, because they're still moving. I mean, it's, still we moving, have yeah. terrains from here that are now in Alaska. <laughs> right. But, but uh, they, they could have come by translation. Yes, a I'm lot sure of they did. And, and could have been from Canada or from... No, Mexico. from the other side, because it was the... We assume from the other side, so they came from California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's an interesting subject. That is, yes. yes. So along the Straits of Fuca, um, lots of fossils. Are they all generally the same age, um, or are they uh, spotty? Okay, or? so you have to tell me whereabouts. They're from well, because there are different things all well, under. Well, I don't want everybody else to know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you want, if you want to write a note, I'll <laughs> But generically, the, would you, so your question is sort of you have this broad geographic range of the strait, 
and, and that between that's A and A and B. That's still different. They're still different. Right, so that's it. So it's a wide yeah. range of agents. Um, most of the stuff from Port Angeles waste okay. is Eocene and Ligocene in age. So from 38, maybe, oh, even up into the Miocene, so probably all the way to 20 million years old. So it's pretty big. If you go the other way, there are other things. There are some older ones there too. There are, there are some older rocks there too, but mostly that's where they are. Thanks. And before the uh, before the Olympics came up, this was all the same as the stuff we get in western in southwestern Washington, the same beds. But the Olympics came and ruined the whole geography. <laughs> um, I'm curious about that uh, Missoula event that you talked about before. I read a little bit about it. <clears throat> what effect did that? When was it? And what effect did it have so, on the geology of Washington State? And how much did it confuse the issue by virtue of you know, this huge wash? You want to do it? Or you do it? Oh, okay, so the, Zula, the question of the Missoula floods, and, and uh, hopefully I will get it right. My understanding of the Missoula floods, it was during the, uh, of, over a fair amount, uh, during the last ice age, there were multiple Missoula floods, something over in the order of 100, if I remember correctly. Right? Um, yeah, different years is different names. Right. Okay, there were a lot. <laughs> and the idea was there was a, a lake um, up in Montana, basically the size of Lake Erie. There was a ice formed by an ice dam, and periodically the ice dam would basically float, and the, all that water would drain out at once, basically equivalent to 10 times the volume of all fresh water rivers flowing on Earth at present would flow down that. I mean, it's a phenomenal, far beyond anything else. And it created these, you know, those massive coolies, these massive beds you see, uh, you think of them, um, the riffle marks of a normal river, these ones are, the riffle marks are a mile apart. So it really completely changed that area and scours out huge sections of land. I mean, what we lost would be interesting to know. And yeah. As Liz said, one of my, my friends, the sloth, apparently were, they get washed out by, it was tragic. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it was a huge event in, in, in changing the landscape. And, but, it was a, but it was so recent um, I don't know how, how much it got into older, much into older material. Was it really removing, do you know if it was removing much of the older stuff over there? Like, Well, it ran across the basalt, so I couldn't imagine there was much yeah, so it's on there, like, but just on the older ones. Um, the people who have done oceanographic cores off the mouth of, of the Columbia can find it. They can find these floods in the cores at periodic times. Um, that's why we have different numbers of which floods they were. You either count what was up on the hills, or you count what was in the cores, or you count. Different people count different things. <laughs> Either way, it was astounding. And multiple events, it was, that was, I think, that was the key, is that it was multiple floods. It wasn't a flood, it was multiple floods. We should take one more question, because it's... Um, we should just take one more question. <laughs> Does Something anybody else have any more questions? Terribly insightful. Interesting. Oh, oh. George. Oh. I was really glad that you brought in the amateur collectors. Okay. Because they don't get enough uh, coverage. Right. And, uh, you know, we actually give awards. The Paleontological yeah. Society gives awards to them. But that's really great because, um, you know, they've done so much to help us find these fossils, and, and yet, you know, <laughs> they hardly ever get recognized. I know, and George also had, was a director of a museum, so he knows all about this. Mm -hmm. But they're a very big part of our story, as you'll see. Yeah, I mean, there's, one of my favorites was a school teacher who lived out on the coast and just would go collect fossils, and she found, uh, what, Copanomus, this, mm -hmm. uh, and then this dolphin, right, mm -hmm. the dolphin. I mean, just this, she was just an amateur, just loved to go out and collect, and, and it was really a fun, because I tracked her, I tracked her family down, and, ooh, we should send, I need to send them a book. Yes, they them were book. so happy that someone was interested in that. So I guess we'll end with uh, two thoughts. One is, if uh, purely selfish, if you're interested, we'd be happy to sell you the books back there. Uh, they're $25 cash check or charge. We've got plenty, so if you want to buy multiple copies, <laughs> four, five, ten, there's a number of excellent holidays coming up uh, I, over the next year. Um, and the other is just, again, to thank you all for coming out. 
uh, tonight for your questions, for your support. And I mean, one thing that for, I think for, I'll speak for both of us is that it, it's always a pleasure to come out because we know that the Quimper gang is such an engaged yeah. and interesting yeah. audience. So thank you always. again. Always. Thanks. Thank, so thank you, Carol. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. January 13th. It's great to see everybody.